Hi there, everyone. Welcome back. In this episode of Conversations with Father Greg, we have a homily for Sunday, October 17th, 2021. Let's begin with a reading from Mark's Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of Christ May I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as some of you may know, I'm a second-career cleric. That's a fancy way of saying that I haven't always been a priest. I began testing out my call to the priesthood almost two decades ago. One of our local Anglican seminaries was offering a two-year program that they called a Diploma in Lay Ministry. It was designed to help lay people develop skills for ministry within their local parish church. I registered for the program as a way to dip my toe in the seminary world, and I'll never forget the first night of classes. It was a Wednesday evening. We gathered for the Eucharist in the chapel, and then dinner in the dining hall. I was a little late getting into the line for dinner. By the time I had made my way through the line, I stood with my tray in hand, looking for a spot to sit. Most of the tables were already pretty full, and as the new person, I didn't really want to push my way past people to find a seat in the middle of a table. Eventually, I spotted one table which was completely unoccupied in the back corner of the room. I was trying to be inconspicuous, and the table at the back seemed perfect. I quietly made my way over, sat down by myself, and began to eat. Before long, I had been joined by six or seven very inquisitive people. They were all very polite, mind you, but something seemed just a little bit out of place. On my way from dinner to class, I chatted with another classmate. It didn't take too long to find out what had been out of place. It was me. I was the one that was out of place. It turned out that that empty, out-of-the-way table wasn't nearly as inconspicuous as I had thought. I had unknowingly sat at the head table. My curious companions were the school principal and department heads. I had completely failed to read the room. That little conversation with my classmate also helped explain why I had gone from wanting to be anonymous to spending a few uncomfortable minutes at the center of attention. We have a similar kind of situation in our gospel reading for today. We see two of Jesus' disciples failing to read the proverbial room. The text that we read today opens with James and John approaching Jesus and telling them that they want him to do whatever they ask of him. I wonder if either of them heard how their request sounded before they said it out loud. 
It almost sounded like something a parent would hear from a pair of preschoolers. Their request made it sound as though they exercised some kind of magical power over Jesus, as though he were some kind of life-sized marionette waiting to do their bidding. They explain that they want to sit one on either side of him when he is in his glory. They had been following him for long enough to know that he was someone pretty special. They had seen him doing some amazing miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, and feeding the hungry. Some were even saying that he was the fulfillment of ancient prophecies about a Messiah that would save Israel. As they walked toward Jerusalem, the political and religious capital of Israel, James and John began to anticipate what might be in store. Would these messianic prophecies be fulfilled in the person of Jesus? Is that why they were heading to Jerusalem? Would he reward his faithful friends with a place of honor? We begin to see that James and John had completely glossed over what Jesus had told them just a few minutes before. You see, immediately prior to the text that we read today, Mark describes a scene in which Jesus predicted his own arrest, torture, and eventually his death. Jesus' prediction of his own death gave voice to his own helplessness and vulnerability at the hands of the establishment. Yet James and John ask him to hook them up with seats of honor when he is glorified. Reading Jesus' response, I can almost hear the frustration in his voice. He tells the pair that they don't know what they're talking about. Jesus talks about sharing in his baptism and in the cup that he is about to drink as metaphors asking the two whether they can share in the suffering that he has just described. Still clueless, they nod and claim to be all in. Jesus acquiesces. But from our perspective in history, we begin to realize that James and John really did not know what they were in for. When the other ten realized what had happened, they were furious with James and John. Another storm for Jesus to calm. Not long before, Jesus had had an encounter with a young man who we often refer to as the rich young ruler. The wealthy young man had approached Jesus, asking about how he might inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus challenged the young man to give up all the wealth that he had come to rely on, to live simply, and to follow him. Now, having had the encounter with James and John, Jesus turns to the rest of the disciples and built on what he had said to that wealthy young man. He gathered the twelve together and continued teaching them about a different style of power. He said that the one who desires greatness must first become a servant. It's as though he were taking the traditional understanding of power and leadership and turning the whole thing upside down. It means challenging the way that we look at the world, what we value, and what we depend on. The thread woven through these stories is an invitation to examine the kinds of things that we rely on. How do we understand ourselves and others? What are the attributes that we value in ourselves and in other people? Put another way, do we seek out God's thumbprint on the lives of those around us? Do we strive to exercise power, control, and authority, or do we try to find ways to bind up the wounds of those who are hurting and to nourish those who hunger for the deeper things in life? Both are expressions of power. It's just that one kind of power is longer lasting and further reaching than the other. Civil rights activist and poet Maya Angelou captured this idea when she said, I've learned that people will forget what you say, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This is the kind of power that Jesus was talking about. Let's pray. 
Most glorious God, in Jesus you call your people to true humility and servanthood. Grant us the boldness to desire a place in your kingdom, the courage to drink the cup of suffering, and the grace to find in service the glory that you promise through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.